Um, our first panel uh, is focused on energy, transportation, construction, agriculture, and manufacture. And within that panel, you could see our global footprint already early on um, because our speakers are truly globally. I will introduce all three speakers. Then I will um, hold all questions as the moderator and entertain questions at the end of the third speaker. Our first speaker today will be Alexander Mueller. Uh, Alexander Mueller is the managing director of TMG, a think tank for sustainability in Berlin, Germany, and a study leader of the economics ecosystem and biodiversity for agriculture and food uh, hosted by the UN environment. He's a member of the German Council of um, Sustainability. He served as assistant director general uh, of the Food and Agriculture Organization in the United Nations, the FAO, from 2006 to 2013. He's a member of the UN Advisory Group on Energy and Climate Change. Um, he's also a member and chaired uh, the United Nations Systems Handling Committee on Nutrition. In Germany, he has served as State Secretary in the Federal Ministry for Consumer Protection, Food and Agriculture, and as State Secretary um, for the, in the Ministry of Health. He is uh, in the Europe, the European Commission actually appointed Alexander um, as a member of the Independent Expert Commission on the Junction on Health, Environment and Bioeconomy, focusing on European research and innovation practices. Alexander um, Muller received his diploma in sociology from Phillips University in Marburg. Our second speaker today is Dr. Joyce and John. Dr. St. John is the executive director of the Caribbean Public Health Agency, representing all 24 Caribbean nations. Um, she is not only a dedicated and reliable um, leader, um, she has a, a significant track record in public health systems management uh, and development, as well as health diplomacy. Um, her, she started her um, Reign as executive director of CARFA in 2019. And in that role, um, she executes all functions laid out by the intergovernment ag agreement of CARICOM. Before that, um, Dr. St. John served as the assistant director general of the World Health Organization from 2017 to 2019 with a direct responsibility on WHO's climate and other determinants of health um, focus. And she was, I should mention, as a proud uh, Caribbean native myself, the first Barbadian um, to become Assistant Director General. Um, before that, she served um, for 12 years as the Chief Medical Officer of Barbados. Um, and um, also, lastly, as the Chairman of the Executive Board of the World Health Organization from 2012 to 2013. Our third speaker in this first session is Dr. Gary Mensavage. Um, Dr. Mensavage is the Senior Health Advisor at ExxonMobil. He received his PhD from the University of Rochester with an MBA from Rutgers. He completed postdoctoral training at the US Army Medical Research Institute in Chemical Defense um, before joining ExxonMobil in Biomedical Sciences. He served very, um, various external roles, including in the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, uh, Medicine, uh, Environmental Health Matters Initiative. Um, he's also a board member of the Health and Environment Science Institute. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Toxicology and a past president of the Society of Toxicology, um, specifically the risk assessment specialty section. So with this, um, really global lineup. Uh, it's my honor now to um, uh, turn it over to Dr. Mueller um, for his remarks. Thanks a lot, Madam Chair, for your friendly introduction and for making me a doctor. That, that's my first honorary doctor I have received and I'm very proud I'm not a doctor. Thanks a lot. I'm, I'm happy to be here on this panel. And I can only congratulate you because I think the voice of the health system has not been heard as loud as it is necessary. And I would like to tell you 
why I think this is necessary. And then I would like to talk about why the sector I have been invited for, agriculture, nutrition, so the food system also has to play an important role and has to link with you in order to join forces. So let me start with my first message. That's a message everybody knows. The world is not on track to achieve the 1.5 degrees or even the 2.0 degrees limit to global warming. That's not new, but we have to say it over and over again. Why? Because not achieving the agreed targets means that adaptation to climate change will become much more complicated, much more difficult and much more costly. And for the health system, it means we will have to spend a lot of more money on health because we don't stop global warming. And I, I really wonder why we do not apply what has been decided in Rio 1992 in the Rio principles. There is one principle called the polluter pays principle. And my proposal is the health sector should just send an invoice to the big polluters and to say, these are the costs because of your inaction. Please pay the bill because we have to provide services to people who are getting sick. And this is related to your emissions. It's a nice coincidence. And uh, I would have made this proposal even if you would be live on a panel that one of our panelists, uh, Gary, is here from Exxon and he is responsible for strategic planning. So prepare yourself. Soon you will get an invoice and you will have to pay for it. You can already put it into your standard reporting. That's my first topic. Polluter pays and the health system will have to spend much more money because of the inaction of others. Second, and I'm happy that the two uh, really great speakers in the beginning already referred to it. If you point with one finger to a person, three fingers are pointing back to you. We all in our sectors have to make a commitment that we do not only complain, but that we also reduce our emissions. It's widely known that the agricultural sector is one of the biggest polluters all over the place. Of course, there's a difference between uh, polluting from a highly industrialized country and from a developing country. So we have to be very careful. There are different responsibilities. The agriculture sector, if you look only at food waste, produces is the third biggest emitter in the world. The first biggest emitter is China, then the United States, and then an unknown country called food waste. Imagine if you go shopping, you have three bags of food you have bought, of course, re re reusable bags, you take them home, and on your way home, you're losing one bag. This is happening all the day in the agriculture sector because one third of all food is lost and we don't consume it. And therefore, we have to do our homework in order to be able to complain about others. My third item goes to the transformation question. I am convinced that we have to tackle the key problem of our food system. And the key problem is the economics are wrong. One of the former presidents of the United States once won his uh, campaign for the election with the sentence, it's the, it's the economy, stupid. And we have to say that we give the wrong prices to our food. Cheap food is actually really expensive for people, for the planet. And therefore, transforming the food system means talking about the true costs of food. Nobody, if you go to a supermarket in an industrialized country, you get very cheap meat. Nobody should believe that this is the real price of the produce. We are externalizing costs, real costs, but nobody is paying for it. And therefore, I think from a perspective of agriculture and food, but I guess this is also valid for other sectors, let us really think about what are the real costs of our economic behavior. The current system, how we measure it, is not only incomplete, it is misleading. And therefore, transformation in the food and agriculture sector has to be linked to look at the true cost of our action and to look at the positive and negative externalities. 
There are many farmers in the world. They are stewards of biodiversity. Nobody pays them. But we want small scale poor farmers in Africa to protect biodiversity. And in our industrialized agriculture, we are destroying biodiversity. Something is completely wrong. And therefore looking at the true costs of food and making invisible externalities visible and accounting for them is for me key. Last but not least, I think we have to join forces in redefining dietary guidelines. Dietary guidelines in future should not only look at the health of people, what food is good for people, but it should also look at what does this mean for the planetary health. Maybe our dietary guidelines will look slightly different, but it would be a step to bring together the important sectors of human health and planetary health, people and environment. We have to bring it together, including a strong social factor. We all know that our food today is very, very cheap because many people are working for very low wages for it. Often these are not decent jobs. And therefore I'm convinced that changing food systems, making them sustainable, making the true costs visible could be a key driver for achieving not only the Paris climate targets, but also coming closer to the internationally agreed sustainability targets. So my last sentence is, send an invoice to the polluters, be credible and make a commitment that is, can be monitored to reduce your own emissions. Talk about the real costs of our action in the food system and elsewhere. Look at the hidden costs and look at the hidden benefits. And third, a fourth, sorry, join forces to develop a new understanding of dietary guidelines good for people and the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Alex. We uh, promised you a bold panel and um, I think we're beginning to keep that promise. It's now my honor to um, invite Dr. Joyce and John to make her remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to present at session one, pragmatic policy recommendations for COP26 at this Road to COP27 virtual summit hosted by the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. My name is Dr. Joyce St. John and I am the Executive Director of her. So first let's set some context. What has been happening in climate change and health in the Caribbean? What have been the milestones of action? And it started on my roadmap in 2002 with the first International Climate Change and Health Conference in SIDS, convened by the Pan American Health Organization. Then, 5 Cs, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, was established in 2004. And in 2013, PAHO 5 Cs, UE, organized the Caribbean Climate Change and Human Health Workshop. In 2018, the WHO CIS initiative on health and climate change, which I had the privilege to lead when I was Assistant Director General at WHO, was held in the three SIDS regions. And in 2019, CARFA published the State of Public Health Report on Climate and Health. So, as we are the most tourism dependent or one of the most tourism dependent regions in the world, I think we need to have a look at what are the impacts of tourism on climate change and health. And there are many. And we've kind of stylized, you see the factory belching out the smoke of pollution, which causes climate change. And we'll see here in this very cleverly um, derived impact of tourism on climate change by Peters in 2017, that tourism currently contributes to a higher share of 
to climate change than directly to the global economy. Imagine that. And air transport causes an increasing share of all tourism and travel related global warming, a share that is currently already over 60%. There's a higher dependency on high energy transport and activities and more luxurious accommodations. So tourism right now is decreasing equal efficiency. And marketers must link the price to the real and perceived value of the tourism product. But they must also take into account the impact on the environment. And we cannot forget that tourism itself is often associated with pollution. The facilities, the hotels, the, the water sports, they're often close to the shore, so there's near shore pollution. There's unfortunately an increased use of plastics in the tourism industry and poor disposal of waste. So what are some current and anticipated solutions? What are some of the ways that we may need to re-engineer our systems to reduce carbon emissions? And here, I talk about Parfus' role because we are all part of the solution. We have a role with environmental monitoring, environmental assessments, and auditing at the Environmental Health and Sustainable Development Department, emergency response, CARFA is part of the deployment of the CEDEMA um, organization, which covers the Caribbean. And of course, it is also vector borne disease management. CARFA is also part of a grouping, which includes CAHO and the Caribbean um, Institute for Neutrology and Hydrology. And we put out regular. Um, We've, we've restarted actually, we stopped um, for COVID-19, but we've restarted, we put out regular Climate Smart Tool, which talks about the upcoming weather, the risks to um, human health, and what are some of the ways that these can be avoided or mitigated. And this gives you a snapshot of what was going on in 2020. The dry season with increased potential for wildfires, short and long-term drought, um, potential ex extensive crop damage and increased humidity, which was expected and did promote mold growth. There has also been the solution of multi-sectoral action and a focus on health and climate change. And here we see that there was actually a Caribbean action plan developed with critical actions under this plan, which included building regional partnerships, strengthening institutional capacity, implementing regional public health communication, and advocating for the region to increase resources to address health during and after disasters and more equitable health systems. And CARFA, as I said before, they published the annual state of public health report. And in 2019, the focus was on climate change. And I'm giving you the link there that you can look for it on my web page. So part of the solution is documenting precisely what is happening in the region. But we cannot have solutions without funding and support for resources. And some of our major donors for climate and health in the region are the EU Cari Forum Project, strengthening climate resilient health systems, the EU Climate Project managed by five Cs with a focus on general climate resilience and the IDB Pilot Project for climate resilience through mitigation and adaptation strategies. So we've got funding and support for resource mobilization. And another solution is multi-sectoral action. And this busy slide is busy for a reason, because we've got a lot of partners. We are adhering to international agreements, and there are also regional frameworks, including the Barbados 
program of action, the Samoa pathway that also frame our multi-sectoral action because part of the solution is working together. And here is a nice problem and solution um, slide that came from Climate Health Action, Empowering Caribbean Action for Climate and Health. And the problem is regional health systems and populations remain highly vulnerable to impacts from climate change, which has caused extreme weather, impacts to health and well-being, inability to attain the sustainable development goals. And the solution proposed was a One Health approach within the Caribbean Cooperation in Health, our current iteration, uh, phase four, contribution to reducing mortality and morbidity from the expected health consequences and including linkages to environmental determinants of health and paying attention to COVID-19. And I think it does not make sense talking about what can work and what are the solutions without doing research. And this year, CARFA had the 65th Annual Health Research Conference, and it was the first virtual health conference. And it talked about the Caribbean's triple threat. Here we have again, climate change. So pandemic entities and climate change. So research by the Caribbean, about the Caribbean, presented in the Caribbean, fostering young researchers, all of that is part of the solution of what Caribbean is facing in terms of climate change and its impacts on health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. St. John. And um, we've seen the Caribbean then as a region um, through Dr. St. John's presentation, um, taking action. Our third speaker, um, and I'm be very pleased to now hand it over to Dr. Gary Minsevich. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great, okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Lickfield, and to all of CUGH and all of the organizers, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I just wanted to highlight that this title slide really reminds me of how humbled and, and grateful I am for the medical professionals who are here on the call with us today. Um, really appreciate everything you do. Very humbled to be in front of this audience. And what I did want to highlight and appreciate, Dr. Mr. Mueller, thank you for pointing out um, the affiliation that I have. I think that's really fantastic that, that, in, that we're together on the panel. Um, what I did want to highlight is I'm, I'm more focused on environmental health. That is my background. But to your point of the invoice, uh, for sure, um, the idea of a price on carbon really is the most simple and economically efficient way to stimulate investment and behavior change across the economy. And we're very much supportive of that. So as far as an invoice, uh, we believe carbon pricing is actually really a significant part that that we need to really focus on as society. And regarding the role that I have in, in the energy industry, I did want to express that I personally find it really challenging and actually exciting. Um, exciting to help figure out how to meet the world's demand for energy, which is really critical and important for human health. And of course, importantly, reducing the environmental impacts and very importantly, those environmental impacts related to climate change, one of the greatest challenges of our time. So to give you a sense of why I find it exciting, we at ExxonMobil, we, we really do seek to actually be a leader in terms of the society's drive for lower carbon future. And for example, what we're trying to do, just to give you a sense of the scale, because scale is really critical here, what we're trying to do, and according to the International Agency, International Energy Agency, we estimate that there could be an opportunity to mitigate 1.5 billion metric tons of CO2 annually. So that is equivalent to taking out 300 million passenger vehicles off the road every year or planting 25 billion trees every year. And what I was gonna do here with this brief presentation was just give you a sense of, of the thinking to, to get to the, towards this big potential solution that hopefully we can all, um, all work towards. What I'd like to do is have you, the folks, the participants here, imagine that you're in the year 2040. So in the year 2040, really think about the following. In 2040, 
we have not a population of over 7 billion, which is what we have today, but closer to and well over 9 billion in 2040. In 2040, the global living, global living standards have increased and continue to rise. In many parts of the world, there has been the largest expansion of the middle class in history. And tied to this larger population and increased middle class, there is more demand for homes, transportation, electricity, consumer goods, and the energy to power them all. So as you sit there in 2040, you recall that today in 2021, there were over 700 million people in the world who lacked access to electricity. By 2040, many now have at least some access to electricity. And why is this important? The, the global, the, the key thing here is the global population, sorry, the, the important um, health perspectives related to the access to energy include some very uh, relevant things, uh, unfortunately still relevant today in 2021, where, for example, inefficient cooking, the United Nations indicates that 2.6 billion people use inefficient cooking systems, which can contribute to poor indoor air quality, exposure considerations, health, absenteeism from school and work, and other potential downstream impacts. And primarily impacting women and girls, what you tend to see is retrieval of water and firewood is particularly dangerous for assault, sexual assault included, very time consuming, resulting in lost opportunity for education and earning, earning wages. And the issue of intermittency of electricity supply in health clinics in developing countries impacts lighting, water pumps, utility of medical devices, impacting night service, diarrheal risk, disease, and neonatal, neonatal risks, respectively. That is, access to modern energy improves a community's quality of life. It's correlated closely with increased life expectancy, reduced poverty and mal mal malnutrition, and higher levels of childhood education. And here, what we're showing is the Human Development Index and the relationship to, to energy. So developed by the United Nations, the Human Development Index plotted on the left axis here is an indicator of human well-being plotted against energy on the bottom axis. The HGI is a composite score of three dimensions, life expectancy, education, standard of living. And you can see, for example, the large blue circle there, the large blue circle is, is China. And it highlights China has a medium energy de demand per person and high human development index versus a country, for example, about like the United States, which has a very high HDI. And really importantly, in 2021, today, well over 3 billion people remain with low or medium human development index. They're energy deprived, facing living conditions that would be considered dire by most people in developed countries. As was mentioned earlier, consider for a moment that today it takes the same annual amount of electricity to run a refrigerator freezer in the US as an average person in a developing country consumes in an entire year. Average energy, energy usage per person in India and Africa is 10% of that of someone in the United States. Imagine that many more people are no longer in this type of situation in 2040, enabled by access to reliable modern energy. So in, in 2040, where does this energy come from? The mix of energy sources to meet the world's energy demands in 2040 are actually, they look very different than they are today. Oil and natural gas together have fallen significantly to below 50% of the mix. Coal has dramatically decreased. Wind, solar, bioenergy, and other low carbon energy sources have risen significantly to nearly 50%. The 2040 energy mix I just described is actually the projected average energy mix in 2040 based on the UN's IPCC lower two degree scenarios. As we know, the IPCC models are the most, some of the most respected and cited in the world. That is, IPCC is est estimates that oil and natural gas will continue to be needed to help the demand in 2040, while renewables and other energy technologies continue to mature and penetrate markets. I think and recognize that 2040 is really just around the corner. The energy system takes time to transition. To understand this further, let's look at really what is driving the continuing need for oil and gas. So on this chart, I'll just go through very briefly. The continuing demand is really concentrated in three hard to decarbonize sectors. So it's not particularly easy to decar decarbonize everything at this stage, given the technology and policy slate that we have in front of us. Those three sectors are power generation, transportation. So we're, most people are familiar with passenger vehicles, but in this case, it's really referring to commercial, commercial transportation sector that's hard to decarbonize, as well as the industrial sector. 
The lack of alternatives to meet the full range of needs in these three important sectors leads to their continued use in 2040. And in the future, the IPCC projects that these three sectors will account for about 80% of the demand, which is similar to today. As a result, for society to meet its ambitions for a lower carbon energy future, assuming that there is no fundamental change in worldwide consumer behavior and movement of goods, and Mr. Mueller referred to that, emissions in these hard to decarbonize sectors need to be addressed. In recognition of the challenges associated with decarbonizing these sectors, as we just discussed, ExxonMobil has been researching for, for 20 years or more solutions to these areas. So today, because of some of that research, we have uh, solutions that are in play today, where, for example, we have well over 200 patents and applications. And um, for example, we are today ExxonMobil is the world's leader in carbon capture, responsible for more than 40% of all the CO2 ever captured. And solutions for tomorrow, where longer term research is really critical uh, to decarbonize, especially those hard to abate sectors that I mentioned. We're focused on research for lower cost hydrogen, lower cost carbon capture, advanced biofuels and manufacturing processes that require ener less energy. And how do we do this? We leverage, we, we work very heavily with academics, with, with other research laboratories, for example, the US DOE and national laboratories to really work on big, very large scale challenges that are in front of us. In 2018, we established a carbon capture and storage venture that we have since actually updated, we have expanded into a low carbon solution business. And one of the key elements of that is that CCS can, can have an immediate impact and significant impact on the hard to decarbonize sectors. So as I highlighted, we as a company have been doing that, others are as well, but it's, it's at relatively small scale still today. According to, uh, just to give you an idea of the, the scale of the solution, for example, subsidies for electric vehicles have been estimated to, to avoid 2 million, 2 million metric tons of CO2 in 2020. The International Energy Agency estimates that if we take CCS carbon capture and storage to a large scale, that could mitigate 1.5 billion metric tons annually. And that's the 300 million passenger vehicles taking those off the roads or planting the equivalent of 25 billion trees that I mentioned earlier. So as a, as a company, as, an in, as a way to prompt these discussions, uh, we have been very active in trying to propose what we're calling um, initiation um, innovation hubs related to carbon capture and storage. And we've been working with uh, policymakers to try to work through the, uh, the, this as a potential solution. And for a large and ambitious project like this to succeed, it's really, it would really require a whole of government approach that the Biden administration has championed, for example, here in the United States, along with support from industry, academia, and very importantly, local communities. If, if a successful, for example, if we could do one of these in the Houston area, one zone could capture 50 million metric tons by 2030 and twice that by 2040, with the idea that the learnings from such a hub can be replicated in other parts of the world. So just wrapping up, just as I highlighted, I mean, there's many, I understand that there's, there can be some frustration with, with our industry, given the connection to uh, the fossil fuel industry and the connection to climate related emissions. But in terms of working to try to tackle the issue, I find it completely fulfilling and challenging to really um, work through these issues with the engineers and physicists, and of course, thinking about the environmental health science as part of it for human health sake. And really just looking forward to uh, continuing the discussion here in this session and really importantly, continuing this, the discussion even after this session with the folks that um, please feel free to reach out to, with, to me. With that, I'll, I'll end my, my talk and hopefully we can have a panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Minsevich. Um, as a panel, we now have about 20 minutes um, to uh, entertain questions. There are some questions in the Q&A that I will share, but I'd like to begin with some of the highlights that um, both the introductory speakers as well as uh, each one of you have brought up. And Dr. Josh and John was only available um, via video. Um, and so I will take the CARFA related question um, in, in a minute. But each one of you have talked about um, partnerships that are critical to get to sustainable solutions. What I what I'd like to hear from you is what are those who are those critical stakeholders 
and what are the driving forces to get to solutions? And so uh, either Alex or, or, or Gary, um, who are the critical stakeholders and what are the primary areas to drive to su sustainable solutions? Either okay. one of you or both of you, please. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to start. Um, yeah, again, thank you very much for the question. Uh, for sure, for example, as I mentioned, the carbon capture and storage um, initiative, thinking really large scale, the, a very key area of, of stakeholder engagement would be at the very local level. Um, in, in the end, such a, such a large scale project would be localized to a particular area. And it, it's critical to have engagement with the communities to understand the, to understand the opportunities in the community to, to further enhance environmental considerations, social considerations as a result of um, potentially working on a project like this. So that's a very specific example. I would cite there, there was actually just this week, hopefully folks had a chance to participate in the session, the National Academies of Sciences Environmental Health Matters Initiative had a really great session on this Tuesday and Thursday focused on communities, climate change and health equity. And it really emphasized the importance of understanding the, the local stakeholder situation and really working through at a local level to understand how we can help those that may be most vulnerable, vulnerable from climate related risks. Thank you, um, Alexander. Mm, thanks a lot. I think getting carbon neutral will become the biggest industrial transformation uh, we, we, we've ever seen on this planet. We, we have to be serious. Moving from basing our growth on fossil fuels, and this was a the success for our uh, economy with very high environmental costs to become carbon neutral, is the biggest industrial transformation we will have to face. And it will take all levels to be involved. We as the consumers, the regulators, the economy, and I strongly believe that we have to make it a business case, but not a business case for greenwashing, a real business case. We need new technologies, we need new ideas. So we have to bring in all the players in order to become carbon neutral. And I'm personally, I, I have some doubts that we can do it all with offsetting. We, we know that many companies now uh, are planning to become carbon neutral by 2040 and they want to do it with offsetting. If we look at the concept for offsetting, they all require huge areas of land for planting trees or for sequestering carbon or for CCS or even CCU, carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and use. And I think the area of land being available for it is very limited. We will have to produce food, we need nature, we need the bioeconomy. And therefore, I personally believe that it takes the collaboration of everybody and we have to develop new technologies, new business models. And these business models have to be able to solve also the problems of the developing countries. Leapfrogging is my last sentence. Don't go dirty first and then try to become solar and clean go solar and clean immediately. And this is a responsibility the global community has to finance. Thank you. Um, in fact, um, to stay with um, the importance and the role of um, lower and middle income countries where they are disproportionately impacted um, by, the, by climate change, but yet they're not necessarily the, the, the highest culprits um, by no means of um, the impact of climate change. In Dr. St. John's remarks, uh, you clearly saw the investment um, from the European uh, Union and, and others um, around resilience and around resilience of systems, including health systems. Um, and so you might ask yourself, well, are we already giving up and all we're focusing on is resilience and adaptation and mitigation, or is there an opportunity for us um, to be public health and focus on prevention before something happens? And so um, let's take the lens, for example, uh, Alexander, around food systems. Are there 
no other opportunities or what would be the opportunities to um, get to a more of a preventive role rather than only an adaptation and mitigation role? Thanks, Maureen. Maybe I'm here for the not so good news, but even if we stop all CO2 emissions today, climate change will continue for a certain amount of time because it takes time to, to uh, get rid of CO2 in, in the atmosphere. And therefore, one of the most important measures is to cut methane emissions because they compared to CO2, they are short lived pollutants. They disappear after 30 years. So if we want to have an impact on what is already in the air and what is the way ahead, we have to drastically reduce methane emissions from all sources. It's agriculture, enteric fermentation, cows, to say it simply. It is production of natural gas and the, the, the gas leakages. It's old waste sites. So this is a way to, to really intervene and to by two between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 degrees to reduce uh, the, the, the increase of temperature. And we have to invest in solutions that provide multiple benefits. We, the, the, the global population is growing. We will need more food. We will need more biomass for the bioeconomy. We will need to protect the environment and therefore all investments should create multiple benefits. It would be wrong if we invest only in increased food production. Increased food production has to go hand in hand with lowering the environmental footprint. And therefore, prevention is good, but we are already on a path towards over two degrees centigrade. And therefore, the key question of resilience, you have addressed it, has to be in the center. And resilience in a crisis is different than re resilience in normal times. One comment um, to stay with, with you, Alexander, for a minute um, from the audience was, well, how do you, if, if we have to transform the, the food system, the agricultural system, how do we take into account those farmers who are subsistence farmers who are vulnerable from the start? Are they in the same position uh, and have the same opportunity um, to make those changes? No, they don't have it. We, we have to be very clear, the world is spending 600 billion of subsidies to farmers and small scale farmers often get nothing or very low uh, support. And therefore there is no level playing field. Uh, it, for, for me, it's also a question of inequality that we have now 810 million people being hungry and many of them are people living in rural areas and many of them are small scale farmers. And therefore, a specific transition pathway for small scale farmers towards sustainability has to increase, has to include to improve their livelihoods. These are the poorest people and any transformation pathway has to address their livelihoods, make their livelihoods better and also their production much more sustainable and more resilient because small scale farmers in the global south are suffering the first and the most from the emissions from the global north. Thank you. And, and Gary, there was a specific question about uh, Exxon's zero net goal. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah, I, I would say very clearly, we, we don't have a zero net goal. And, and the reason that we, we don't have that at the, is the, the focus is on developing plans that, that can drive uh, reduction, the, our own emissions reductions very clearly over a given number of years. So for example, since 2016, we've reduced our emissions uh, by 11%. Uh, and that was based on very significant plans that we had out to 2020. We have another set of plans in place by 2025 to further reduce those plans. And what we do is we work towards significant plans over a period of time that we can uh, very clearly manage and actually drive those effect effectively and efficiently in our, in our plans. If you look at um, society's ambition to get to, to net zero, uh, what you certainly see, and as, as Mr. Mueller highlighted, and to say again, we are not on track 
a society to get to 1.5 or to two at this stage. And we'll see the NDCs, um, we'll see what kind of NDCs we have coming up here in the next few months. But as a company, if you look at the, the trajectory of our emissions reductions, we're well ahead of where society is in terms of um, staying within that trajectory to, to get to towards the 1.5 or two degrees C based on the plans that we put in place five years or so at a time. Um, and of course there are uh, among our participants and just within the world um, to see um, the fuel industry as, as the major culprit of uh, carbon uh, emissions and other uh, areas that are related to fossil fuel. And so um, I, I think it's really important and you have the opportunity and, and all the fuel industry to, to collaborate and to partner. And so um, are there things, and of course you're not speaking for the fuel industry right now, um, but are there things from your science perspective as an environmental health scientist um, that would connote a partnership through partnership that you would suggest as a solution from the fuel industry um, to collaborate with other partners? Are there issues of low hanging fruit you talked about being involved locally, but if you could give us some examples, that would be great. Sure, yeah, thank you for that question as well. Yeah, and I, I see some of the comments and I, again, I can understand the concerns of, of having somebody from the petroleum industry participate in these discussions, but I think one thing to that, that I think from our perspective we see is um, you know, we are not on track to get there as a society. The scale that is really, that is really critical here, as I mentioned, 1.5 billion metric tons, that's the level of impact that we need sooner rather than later. Um, the, the expertise of folks from a company like, like mine and, and our industry, I think it's gotta be leveraged in this process. So hopefully having them at the table, uh, we can all work towards the same solution as, as we're all work towards solutions as we're all in, in the same, same boat and working and wanting to have these reductions. I guess as far as collaborations, that's really what it's going to take. It's essential to have the collaborations I highlighted on the one slide, the very significant collaborations that we've we've have um, ten billions of ten billion of, of our own dollars towards research over the past couple of decades on, on very targeted areas of these hard to decarbonate decarbonize areas. Collaborating with academics, um, national labs, and others uh, around around the globe. So that's in the more the engineering the research space tied to engineering and physics. Um, on the environmental health side, for sure, the, the, the problem um, is, is huge, it's, it's immense. And just to give you an idea, and I'm sure you're very well aware of it, um, I would say on average, there's maybe 1600 publications related to specifically climate and health that come out every year. Um, that's a lot of research that's going on. Uh, it's very difficult to stay on top of that on one hand. And if you look at the different collaborations that you see in that research, what, what you tend to see is it's, it's academic institutions within the same region typically collaborating. Um, and there's, as best I could tell from the analysis that, that I've done, maybe not a lot of um, wider stakeholders, whether community representatives, maybe even industry involved in those. I think there is a broader opportunity for cross-regional research um, in the environmental and human health space and probably additional stakeholders. And importantly, what I think is gonna be important is helping to drive collaborations with areas where they have higher levels of resource with, with those who have lower levels of resource. So in some cases, maybe that's partnerships from China, the United States with areas in Africa, for example, to really focus on some of those local areas to really get the data at the local level that we need to, to be informed about what's going on related to mitigation, prevention, adaptation, all of the above. Last uh, eight minutes or so, I'd like us to focus on solutions, which is, has been the uh, leading threat um, through this whole uh, workshop. So beginning, um, Alex, I wanna go back to the bold statements that you made on the food um, industry, beginning with, um, not recognizing or documenting or publishing really um, the true cost of our actions in the food system. And secondly, um, I think equally bold is to really redefine 
um, the dietary guidelines in a way that's good for people and good for planetary health. So those are singularly um, very powerful and bold um, solutions. How, um, what's a roadmap to their solutions? The, the, the title of this workshop, what are some crumbs around that roadmap that you can give us? That's the billion dollar question, thanks a lot. Let, let, let me start with really thanking Dr. Minsevich to be on the panel because I think we need the dialogue. It is not good that only people who are agree are sitting on the dialogue because we have to find out what is the best way forward and it is complex. I see, before I concretely answer your question, three ways forward with fossil fuels. Either we develop a new business model for solar and renewable energy, and this has to be a business model, and we solve the problems with, with the emissions, or we find a way forward which has been presented to capture the emissions from fossil fuels and to store them somewhere or to use them as, as an input for, for industrial processes. So far, we only have small scale projects. It's not a solution, it's not available today, not available tomorrow, so therefore I'm skeptic. Or we will see a development where investments in fossil fuels will become stranded assets because of the climate crisis. And I prefer to discuss and to collaborate with Exxon and others on the first solution, how can we really go forward? This includes, and here I'm going to answer your question, that we change our economics. Let's be honest, we can produce sugar for very low prices. We can produce soft drinks for very low prices. People drink it and then we are wondering where obesity comes from. Therefore, the economic foundation of our food system is providing the wrong incentives, both from subsidies and from these, the side of how we are costing and the externalities or if how we are ignoring externalities and therefore a debate on the economic foundation of our growth I think is really really important. Uh, the GDP is, is a social construct. It has been developed over 200 years if you are, know the, the, the system. It has, fine -tuned, has been fine-tuned after World War II to meet the demands of, of a, a destroyed economy. But now we are entering a new phase and we find out, and Dr. Minsevich said it, nature is not for free. You cannot emit CO2 for free. It has a price and we have to factor it in. And if this happens, I think we will see a very, very different landscape and we will see very different solutions. So it's the economy we have to change in order to create new new opportunities in order to create new business models. We want a world where poor people don't have to be hungry and therefore we, we, we have to further develop. And the economic solution is for me in the center. Thank you very much for being um, concrete, even on this million dollar question. Um, I'd like in the last couple of minutes to address some of the questions that um, Dr. Uh, Joyce and John would have answered. The focus on the health systems, one of the questions in the Caribbean, the resilience health system, is to create more smart hospitals. You know, um, in the Caribbean, the, the Caribbean population faces kind of a quadruple threat, um, disparities, persistent environmental health threats, disasters, climate change, and um, challenges dealing with planetary health, as Alex brought up before. And so um, this session was about bringing partners and sometimes disparate partners and disparate systems together on a road to solutions with sp the specific lens of energy, transportation, and agriculture. Um, you've heard from our speakers um, that there are challenges, that partnerships are critical, and that those have to be driving towards multi-sectoral actions. Um, you've heard that um, while we, we are behind in uh, achieving what we, we set forward in terms of global warming, 
we are making um, progress in, um, resilient, in the resilience aspect, even in the countries that are most vulnerable, uh, specifically in the Caribbean. You've also heard that local action is where it is. Um, if we want to um, get about, bring about change and that food systems are an important uh, aspect of where change can occur. And then lastly, we've heard the importance of um, a new business model um, that will help us not only make the business case, but look beyond not only what's good for humans, but also what's good for the planet. Um, thank you for those of you who participated in our first session. And it's um, my pleasure now um, to turn over um, the microphone, so to speak, virtually um, to Dr. Liz Grant for our second session. Thank you.